We've seen that organic molecules exhibit different levels of structure. At the top level is the molecular formula, the number and types of atoms that the molecule is made out of. The next level down is how those atoms are connected to one another, what we call the constitution. From there, we go down to the positions of the atoms in space. We call that configuration, and in particular, configurations that are related by easy processes we call conformations or conformers. From these levels of structure, we can imagine different types of isomers, which differ at the different levels, but are the same at the higher levels. And we can classify isomers and classify isomeric relationships using kind of a flow chart that starts with the broadest level of structure and moves down to more and more specific types. It's worth keeping in mind that to do this, we need two molecules for comparison. Isomerism is a relation. That's a, an important concept to understand about isomerism, that it refers to two molecules and the relationship between them. It's kind of like friendship in that regard. I make the analogy of friendship. It doesn't make much sense to say John is a friend unless we know who he's a friend of. That might be implied in the statement, but to be a friend, you have to be a friend of somebody. Isomerism works the same way. You can't just be a constitutional isomer. You have to be a constitutional isomer of a different molecule. So how does this process of classifying isomers work in general? Well, as I mentioned before, we start at the broadest level and work our way downward. So first we start with the question, do the two molecules under investigation have the same molecular formula? If the answer is no, well then the molecules of course aren't isomers at all. They're entirely different, even at the most broad level of chemical structure. If they do have the same molecular formula, then they are isomers of some type because they at least match at the level of the numbers and types of atoms in the molecules. If they do not have the same connectivity, well then they differ on the level of constitution and therefore they are constitutional isomers. This is a thought process that we've seen before in discussions of constitutional isomerism. But what if the molecules have the same connectivity? Does that mean that they are perforce identical at that point? Well, they can be, and if the molecules are identical, even at all the other levels of structure, they're exactly the same, and we call them homomers. However, they can still differ from one another in the positions of their atoms in space. In other words, the connections can all be the same, but the orientations of the atoms with respect to one another can be different. And in that case, the molecules differ at the level of configuration. There are two different types of configurational isomers. There are two different types of configurational isomers, enantiomers and diastereomers. You'll also hear these referred to as stereoisomers since they differ in their stereochemistry. If the two molecules under investigation have the same connectivity, differ from one another, and are mere images, then they're what we call enantiomers. Enantiomers are defined as non-identical mere images. If the molecules have the same connectivity but are not mirror images, then they're what we call diastereomers. So this is the basic process. Let's apply it to a few examples. Our task here is to identify the isomeric relationship between each pair of molecules below. And just to save us time, I'll go ahead and mention that all of these have the same numbers and types of atoms in each molecule. And so none of them are entirely different. They're all isomers of some kind. If we look at the first example here, we should notice right away that the connectivity of the two molecules is different. There's a methyl group in this right-hand structure where we don't see a methyl group in the left-hand structure, and we have a five-membered ring on the right where there's a six-membered ring on the left. That means that we can immediately conclude that these are constitutional isomers. They differ in the connections between their atoms. Moving to the right now, we see two molecules that look very similar in structure. And I'll go ahead and add the implicit hydrogens here just to clarify things a little bit. If we start at one carbon and kind of walk along the structure, what we find is that the connectivity of the two molecules is exactly the same. In other words, we run into the same types of atoms as we walk along in both molecules, ignoring the three-dimensional positions of those atoms. So they're not constitutional isomers. In fact, they have the same constitution. But they do seem to differ. In particular, where we see a CH3 coming out towards us in the left-hand structure, there's a CH3 going back away from us in the right-hand structure. So these might, at first glance, 
look like stereoisomers, look like configurational isomers of some kind. However, at the point where you try to identify whether the two molecules are identical or not, it's important to do everything you can in terms of rotating both molecules, rotating around bonds, to make sure that you're not just seeing the same molecule drawn two different ways. And if we, for example, turn this molecule on the right over like so, kind of flip it over like a pancake, what would that do to the structure? Well, that would leave the five-membered ring looking the same way it had before. The two double bonds change places, but we wouldn't know that. That swings the CH3 from going back to coming out towards you, and that swings the hydrogen back to the back. This structure is identical to that structure, and hopefully this drawing makes that fairly clear. Consequently, these two molecules are what we call homomers. They're identical in every way. They're just two drawings of the same molecule from different viewpoints. Let's keep moving. In this example now, we again see that the molecules have the same connectivity. Where they differ, however, is in the positioning of these hydrogen atoms and the NH2 groups. It's evident that we have a hydrogen pointing up in the left-hand structure, and that same hydrogen is pointing down in the right-hand structure, and vice versa for the NH2 groups. We can now ask the same question that we asked in the last case, which is, are we just looking at two different drawings of the exact same molecule? If we try to do the same thing we did in the last case, turn one of these molecules over to line up the hydrogens in the NH2 groups, what happens? Well, we indeed bring a hydrogen to the front and an NH2 to the back, starting to line things up. But now, the methyl group, which was on the right, is now on the left, and the carboxylic acid, which was on the left, is now on the right. And so you see that if we tried to take this and superimpose it on the structure right here, not everything would line up. Namely, the carboxylic acid would be over where the methyl group is, and the methyl group here would be over where the carboxylic acid is in the other molecule. And so we can't get things to line up. The fundamental root of this is the fact that we have a tetrahedral carbon with four different groups attached to it near the center of each of these molecules. So we haven't drawn the molecule two different ways. These two molecules are actually different. They must therefore be stereoisomers. To determine what type of stereoisomers they are, we need to determine whether they're mirror images or not. And actually, the structure that I've drawn on the left does a nice job of showing how these two molecules, in fact, are mirror images of each other. If I imagine throwing a mirror down between these, you should notice that the NH2 group will be looking at this NH2 group like it look, would look in a mirror, and the same idea applies to this hydrogen as well. So reflecting this molecule simply generates this molecule on the left. These two are enantiomers of each other. Another way to verify this that's a little more systematic is to apply a reflection, for example, to reflect through the plane of the screen in this molecule and then verify that the reflected molecule is in fact identical to the molecule on the left. Since we've already concluded that the two molecules are not the same, this verifies that they are in fact mirror images of each other. What about the next case? Well, the next case is very interesting. The connectivity of the two molecules appears to be the same, and we can see that if we draw out in just a flat representation without any three-dimensional information the two structures. Putting a chlorine here or here is going to generate the same structure regardless. Without any three-dimensional information, we could simply turn over the molecule with the chlorine drawn on the left, for example, to generate the molecule up here. But when we bring in the three-dimensional information, we see that the situation is a little more complicated than this. For example, if I wanted to bring this carbon over to the back position so that it lined up with the carbon bearing the chlorine in the left-hand structure, I could do that by rotating around an axis like this, but that would lead to a situation where the bromine is now pointing down instead of up. And while the chlorine is in the right position, it too is pointing down instead of up. Clearly, these two structures are not the same. And so we're looking at a situation where these are, and so we're looking at a situation where these molecules are related as stereoisomers. To prove whether they're enantiomers or diastereomers, we need to decide whether they're mirror images or not. And to do this, 
I'm going to reproduce the molecule on the left down here just so I have a little more room to draw. And I'm going to draw the molecule on the right in a slightly different orientation by rotating like this 180 degrees to bring the bromine over kind of to this side. We now have a chair structure that looks like this, and now the chlorine that was in the front has swung around after this rotation to the back, and so it's now sitting here. When we line up the molecules in this way, we see that the left-hand molecule is looking at the right-hand molecule as it would at its reflection in a mirror. The two molecules are related as mirror images, so these two are enantiomers. Finally, we have the case on the bottom here. The two hydroxyls in the left-hand structure are both pointing up, whereas one is pointing down and one is pointing up in the right-hand structure. And so we have a trans versus cis situation here. We don't necessarily need to get into the intricate details of the chair forms to see that these are not the same molecule, first of all, but they do have the same connectivity. If I removed the three-dimensional information by just drawing straight lines where these wedges and dashes are, I would see the same structure in both places. That tells us that the connectivity of both molecules is the same. However, I certainly can't perfectly overlay this molecule on the left on the molecule on the right, for example. I'm gonna run into issues with this carbon on the left-hand side. The configuration right here is clearly not the same as the configuration here with the hydroxyl group up and the hydrogen down. So they're different molecules. However, they're not mere images of each other. I'll leave this for you to verify on your own, but these two molecules are not mirror images. Consequently, they must be diastereomers. They're stereoisomers or configurational isomers, but they're not mirror images. Therefore, by definition, they're diastereomers.